Welcome to URI's Long Road to the Vote Suffrage Centennial Lecture Series. Hope is resilience, ambition, focus, excellence, excelling. Hope is a future guided by passion, research, support, decided by you. Good evening and welcome to URI's Long Road to the Vote, Suffrage Centennial Lecture Series. I'm Eve Stern, Director of URI Center for the Humanities, and I'm delighted to have you with us tonight. This year-long series commemorates the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment and the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment. Tonight's panel on getting out the vote is the first of four exciting programs we have planned this semester. Tonight's presentation will start with a short video about our suffrage series. History is a central humanities discipline and the centennial of the 19th Amendment is a critical milestone in American women's and political history. The history of suffrage in the United States is complex, but we the people do have the tools within our power to make the changes that can move us forward. For history students to be able to see what an important role Rhode Island played in fighting for women's suffrage, I think is, is going to really influence the way students think about social movements. Especially with this past election, we've seen what a relevant issue uh, voting rights is. It's definitely refreshing, but also important to listen to actual experts who have been in this field um, share their expertise. It reminds us that these issues are not over and that they still need strides to kind of overcome some of the barriers. As we started our planning, we realized that 2020 was not only the 100th anniversary of the 19th Amendment granting American women the right to vote, but also the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment, which at least nominally enfranchised black men, although it took you know, another century for that right to really be realized. My students had the opportunity to analyze a primary source document from 1916. The document is from Rhode Island, a resolution in favor of women's suffrage, or the Susan B. Anthony Amendment as it was called back then. And we just kind of wanted to find out, you know, who they were, where they were born, where they were from, what they liked to do, and these women, their stories weren't told and now they are. It's important to learn about the suffragists and their motivations and exactly what they were aiming to do. We hope people will walk away with an appreciation for the importance of the humanities for interpreting current events and understanding the world we live in. Tonight's panel on getting out the vote will feature in this order organizer and campaign strategist Kate Coyne McCoy of KCM Consulting, Rhode Island Representative Justine Caldwell, a Democrat representing East and West Greenwich, and Professor Stella Rouse from the University of Maryland. We will have questions and answers after the panel, so please type your questions into the comments at any time, and also please like and share us on social media. Now I'd like to welcome Professor Shauna Merko Pearson Merkowitz, a professor of political science and director of URI's Social Science Institute for Research, Education, and Policy. Shauna will introduce each panelist before she speaks. Welcome, Shauna Pearson Merkowitz. Thank you, Eve, and thank you for having me tonight. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce our panelists today. I will be introducing them as they present. Our first presenter is Kate Coyne McCoy. Kate Coyne McCoy is the principal of KCM Consulting and has been a fellow and lecturer in the Women's Public Policy Program at Harvard University since 2005. Starting in 2012, KCM Consulting provided training, technical assistance, and ongoing support to candidates, not-for-profit, 
organizations across the country. Coy McCoy has assisted in races at every level of the ballot from school board to presidential. She is wi widely recognized as an accomplished fundraiser, media trainer, and campaign tactician. Her efforts contributed significantly to several historic victories in previous cycles, including the election of Rhode Island's first female governor and first Latina secretary of state, and the conversion of red to blue legislative seats in Florida. Coy McCoy has spent most of her career advocating for progressive social change. Trained and educated as a social worker, she's built coalitions and organizations focused on social and economic justice issues, including healthcare. For nearly a decade, she was the regional director of the Political Opportunity Program at EMILY's List, the largest political action network in the United States. There, she recruited, trained, and supported pro-choice Democratic women candidates at the federal, state, and local level. Please join me in my excitement to welcome Kate Corin McCoy. Thank you so much, um, Shauna. I appreciate that lovely um, introduction. And I want to thank the Department of uh, Arts and Humanities at URI for pulling together this extraordinary program. Um, I wake up every day for the last 25 years, and the first thing I do is look at the news to see which male members of Congress have taken ill or died. And I do that because I want to replace them with women. I've devoted the last um, more than two decades of my life running around the country. I've worked in 45 states and in um, with candidates seeking election in Europe, in the EU, in Africa, in Bangladesh, in India, literally all over the world. Um, my goal is to make the world a better place by electing democratic women, by electing women. Um, I only work for Democrats. This is probably a nonpartisan program, um, but that's sort of where my values and where my, um, my work have, have aligned. So this program is about getting out the vote. And I want to leave you all with the idea that there's something good to go vote for. And to my way of thinking, and I hope you agree with me, that is a woman on the ballot. Um, women are grossly underrepresented in every single seat of government. And we know that when women are at the table, issues like healthcare and childcare and income justice and uh, social justice issues are addressed in a very different way. I'm not I'm not saying it, you should um, vote for someone because they're a woman, but I'm saying that uh, when women on the ballot, they, they do as well as men and they address the issues and are productive in ways um, that men don't address issues and aren't as productive. Um, women address family issues in ways that men just don't. Um, why do we have to wake up every day or why do I have to wake up every day and scour the country uh, recruiting women? It's because of three, for three reasons really. Most of the women that I initially asked to run don't believe they're qualified. They think they need to finish their master's degree or do another two years in their business and expand their, their business acumen. They think they need to go to law school. Um, you know, there's all kind of, they need to have their babies. They need, they need, there's always something else. And what I say to them is if you think you're not qualified, you go home and you turn on C-SPAN and you look who's running your country. Um, it's horrifying to me. And I think that the answer is you. If you are sitting out there watching this and you're a woman, um, you are qualified. And very selfishly, I don't want to sit and wait another 10 years for you to finish your master's degree or finish this PhD you're working on. Um, I want you to run now. You're qualified. Um, the everyday skills that you engage in as a woman, um, I'm guessing at where you come from and where you're seated now, position you well um, to seek and serve an elected office. The next reason that women don't run is because generally they are not asked. And we are, we've seen since the election of Donald Trump, um, 
more women self motivated without being pushed by a party apparatus or by uh, a coalition or an organization. We're seeing more women come to the fore and say, you know what, I could do this. Uh, and, and not only could I, but I should and I want to. Um, it used to be that we would have to ask women over and over again uh, to get them into, into elected politics, but that, that really is, is being reduced um, by the day, I think. And then the last reason that we have that I have trouble getting women in is that they say, okay, Kate, like I have three kids, a dog, um, a, a partner. My mother-in-law lives with us and has Alzheimer's disease and I have a full-time job. When the hell do you think I'm going to run for office? When am I going to work and serve in office? And what I say is let's take out your calendar and let's see if we can find 10 hours in the next week that you are unscheduled and could be put to, you know, put, put those hours to work. That's sort of the barrier, the, 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 the base. If you can find 10 hours, you can begin to build a constituency and a candidacy um, and a campaign and seek and serve in elected office. So I'm about sort of out there every day. I wanna leave you with the one idea. If you're sitting watching this, and you've ever even had the glimmer of a thought that you could run for office, you should do it. If you need help, you should call me. I will help you. If you say you uh, came to this program and you decided you wanted to run, I will help you for free. Um, we've got to move more women into government spaces, into the leadership positions. Um, and that can only happen if the women sitting watching this, uh, students at URI, uh, get off the couch and um, get themselves active into elections. The best way maybe is to volunteer on an upcoming election and see maybe if it's if it if it's right for you. Get yourself to a, a candidate training this year. Uh, during the course of the year, uh, there will be several held in Rhode Island. Get yourself to one of those if you have. Um, any questions about how, how to go about it? There are lots of resources and places to go. Um, I'm, I'm guessing that our next guest, Justine Caldwell, would be happy uh, to tell you about how to, how to get engaged and how um, where the help is for folks who wanna get on the ballot. Um, so don't forget to vote in Tuesday's election and give the, give the idea of seeking and serving an elected office, a, 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 you know, just let it sink into your head for a little bit. It, don't dismiss it out of hand. Uh, if you've got a little bit of time, you're already qualified and you've been asked. And there are folks out here who will help you. We've got to have more women seeking and serving in elected office. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kate. Next, we are lucky to welcome Representative Justine Caldwell. She won election to the Rhode Island General Assembly in 2018 after a successful grassroots campaign with special outreach to young voters. A URI alum with a BA and MA in English, Representative Caldwell also holds a PhD in American Studies from Bowling Green State University. She has sponsored laws aimed at curbing the opioid crisis, reducing gun violence, and replacing the state's outdated parenting laws with more inclusive legislation. Prior to her election, she worked as an organizer for a 2012 referendum that established gay marriage rights in Maine. While studying for her PhD at Bowling Green, she led a successful effort against a voter initiative that would have stripped protections for LGBT people in a city non-discrimination ordinance. Please join me in welcoming Representative Justine Caldwell. Thank you, Shana. Thank you, everyone. I'm so happy to be here. Um, as Shana said, I am a URI alum, and I'm always so happy to come back to URI, um, even virtually, and join everyone. Um, I really felt like I had really became um, myself, and even, you know, always am using my experiences at URI and in their fabulous English department in the work that I do today. Before I get started, I do want to echo Kate's point, which is that if you're thinking of running for office and you feel like you don't know where to get started, I will also help you. Um, so you can reach out uh, to me and I would be glad to talk with you. 
I talked with two young women um, from URI in the past week in the lead up to this event, and they were so inspiring and so much more um, active in their community than I was when I was their age. And I'd be glad to help um, anyone who is thinking about that or has any questions. So as Shana mentioned, I actually got started in politics as a student on a college campus. I was a volunteer on a, a ballot initiative to make sure that gay people could not get fired from their jobs or kicked out of their home uh, just for being gay when I was writing my dissertation. And so I will also agree with Kate that your dissertation will wait for you um, for quite a long time if you wanna take a break and uh, get yourself out there in public service. Um, and in the campaign that we ran in Bowling Green, College students were a huge part of it. We actually, on election day, when we counted votes, we were behind. And in the two weeks following that election day, we went back and we found all the students who were on our college campus who had cast provisional ballots. And they had to go certify their ballots saying that they lived there and they had to have like their proof of residency um, at their address at the college. And so, even in the first campaign I ever worked on, college students were a huge part of our win on that issue, and it was really exciting. And so a lot of times I feel like when I am talking with young people, they are sometimes disillusioned with the political process and they don't think it's important to vote. And that is one of the huge barriers, I think, that we have to move past. Because if any particular community, if young people don't vote or women don't vote, um, then your interests and experiences are just not represented at the state house or the town council or on the school board or in Congress. And we see examples of that. I live examples of that every day. You know, like when we are going through this year of distance learning, I have two young kids who are six and nine. So they are in kindergarten and third grade. And I'm one of the only um, moms of young children. Actually, I might be the only mother of young children in the Rhode Island house out of the 75 of us. And I'm certainly the only primary caregiver of young children in the house. And so, you know, when people would talk about what distance learning would like and what policies we should ask for and how it was affecting people, you know, I was really the only one there who could speak from experience about what was happening in the homes of you know, mostly women who might have had to leave their jobs or cut back significantly on their jobs in order to be home with their children. And so, you know, having people with your experiences and your voices represent you is so important. And um, I'm sure Kate will agree that, that, you know, the one thing, I guess I am a politician now and I'm around a lot of politicians. And the one thing that we can do very well is count votes. And so the more that your particular community votes, the more power you're going to have right, with that elected official and in that body where they serve. So when I was running for re-election this year, you know, it was a very big election. Obviously, the presidential election at the top of it, um, you know, we knew we were going to get a lot of Democrats out to vote. And so we decided that we were worried that folks in my district who were maybe under 30 would come out and they would vote in the race between Donald Trump and Joe Biden, and they would leave the rest of their ballot blank because they wouldn't know um, who was on there and they wouldn't know who they were and they wouldn't know why those races were important. So in my election this year, we sent a letter to every voter in my district under 30 and we told them that other than the presidential ballot, there was another really important race on their ballot, which was the one between uh, myself and my opponent, who was um, the gentleman that I had beat the first time around. So we had a rematch. And so he and I are very ideologically opposed. Um, he was a Trump supporter and on all the big issues that we vote on at the state house, he and I were on opposite sides. So we sent this letter out um, to voters under 30 and you know, laid out the differences between the two of us. And we explained to these voters why it was important that they also vote in this race because the decisions that are made at the Rhode Island state house you know, affect them every day. And, um, I have sent out a lot of mail, you know, as a candidate uh, running for two terms, and I have never received nearly the amount of responses combined from all that mail that I got from this newsletter. So many people who got it called me and they said, thank you for sending it to them. Um, thank you for caring about their vote. Uh, thank you for asking for their vote. 
and you know that they really appreciated it because maybe they didn't know about this race on their ballot and they were really excited to vote. You know, I got some um, calls from some of the people who got it and they said, I already voted, but I was just so excited. You know, um, they, I talked to so many kids who had just voted in their first election, right? Because we sent it to kids 18 to 30, people 18 to 30. Um, and they would just call me to tell me they had just voted for the first time and how excited they were. And that was really, that was really fun and special and definitely one of the most one of the best experiences I've had, you know, sending out a piece like that. Um, but what was telling is that my opponent um, was really negative about this letter. So he went on the radio and said that, you know, because I wanted, because I was targeting voters under 30, that I was desperate for votes and that I was afraid I was going to lose. Um, and he really disregarded a lot of the issues that young people care about, you know, mostly climate change, uh, gun violence prevention, um, in the election uh, of Joe Biden over Donald Trump. And, you know, I had a lot of people reach out to me after that who had gotten the letter and were just so offended that, you know, somebody would just be so cavalier and dismissing all of their concerns. And, you know, this is a reason that young people don't always vote. They feel like their votes and they are dismissed and their ideas are dismissed um, when really they deserve so much more than that. And, um, you know, obviously it was effective. And so <laughs> as a strategy, I would also um, encourage other people to employ, but also it really makes people feel involved in the political process. And I think as Kate pointed out, um, you know, my best advice for people would be to volunteer on a campaign, especially a local campaign, maybe one in East Greenwich, but maybe one <laughs> closer to you wherever you are, because you really learn um, how a campaign works, but you also realize really learn how all our different levels of government affect your everyday life. And I think when I think about young people not running or not voting or women not running and not voting, you know, you really need to have that moment where you understand that this person who now is on my school committee and is deciding whether my kids are going back to school full time or this person who is in my state legislature and, you know, believes that we should all have assault weapons. Uh, you know, some people really need to have that moment. And I do think a lot of young people had that m moment about voting in this election. Um, you know, I have always had um, some college students working on my campaigns. And it's always been my favorite times when we are driving around, getting ready to campus or knock on doors. Um, their experience is invaluable. My The first um, College student I had worked for me, Sophie, then went on to work on Elizabeth Warren's campaign uh, last summer. You know, it really gives you a good insight into how campaigns work and how your local government works. Um, you know, seeing the video that you all played at the start of this was really inspiring to me, seeing the students here at URI who, um, you know, are really going to go on to be voters in the world and they're going to work to elect the sort of folks that um, Kate helps elect. And folks like me, I hope, who are up there to try to represent their interests. And I do think, um, you know, voting is habit forming. So I feel after the, the huge amount of young people we had voting in 2020 can only can only raise in the future. So thank you. Thank you so much, Justine. It is now my pleasure to introduce a friend and scholar of American politics. Professor Stella Rouse is an associate professor in the Department of Government and Politics and the director of the Center for Democracy and Civic Engagement and the associate director of the University of Maryland Critical Issues Poll. Dr. Rouse's research and teaching interests focus on youth politics, Latino politics, state politics, civic engagement, and immigration. She is one of the country's most renowned experts on Latino elected officials and the political preference and behavior of millennials. A native of Columbia, she is the author of two books, Latinos in the Legislative Process, Interests and Influence, which was voted as one of the best political science books of 2013 by the Huffington Post, and The Politics of Millennials, Political Beliefs and Policy Preferences of America's Most Diverse Generation. Her work has been funded by the Ford Foundation, the National Science Foundation, and the Russell Sage Foundation. Please join me in welcoming my friend, Dr. Stella Rouse. Shanna, thank you so much for that introduction. Um, I don't know about world renowned, but I'll take it for sure. 
Uh, and it's great to be on this panel and, and follow really two terrific uh, discussions and, and presentations about getting women to run for office and, and personal experience of a, of a woman running for office and trying to get young people to uh, to be engaged in the process. It's something that I that I really believe in. And, and hopefully in my presentation, I'll show that um, young people are not really that disengaged. It's just that they engage differently. So with that, I want to go ahead and hopefully share my presentation here. Um, let's see. All right, so um, let me get started here. Uh, so something that I do want to start with is, is this idea of stereotypes for young people, and in particular, millennials. Um, I'm sure all of you have heard certain stereotypes about millennials and Generation Z. Uh, you know that they're addicted to avocado toast, and for that reason, you know, they're unable to, to save money and, and, and um, invest or purchase a home or, or, or things like that, that they're you know, living in, in, the, in the basement of their parents' house and that they're lazy and entitled and that they're self-absorbed. And these are all stereotypes that have been put forward to describe millennials and young people um, you know, that are really not true. And that the research that I have done on young people really shows that, that are not true. There is one stereotype though that, that probably does fit millennials to a certain extent and young people to a certain extent that I hope to sort of work through and dispel a bit. Um, and that is that they, they tend to vote, uh, much less likely to vote than older adults. Um, and for that reason, as Justine mentioned, right, that uh, if young people aren't voting and are not engaged in the political process, politicians are likely to ignore them right, and likely to ignore the issues that they care about. They're gonna focus on those who do vote. And if you see the, the bar all the way to the left on this, right, those who are age 65 and older vote at very high rates. And therefore politicians often pay tremendous attention to the issues that senior citizens care about, right? Um, and in order for young people to change that, they really do have to engage in, in the political process and ultimately um, get out there and vote. Um, so before I get started in, in providing a little more information about uh, the political participation of young people, I do want to define wh when I talk about young generations, I'm talking about millennials who are those who were born between uh, 1981 and 1996. Um, and those, you know, we tend to think about millennials as those who experience some part of their formative years around the turn of the century. And Generation Z are really those that were born after 1996. There hasn't really been um, an end date ascribed yet uh, to Generation Z. Um, so it, it, it really does cover all those folks that are not millennials and were born after 1996 at this point. Um, we know about millennials as being fully uh, digital natives, right? They're the first generation to, to really absolutely not have experienced um, the non-digital age, right? We say that about millennials as well, but older millennials, I think, still remember what it was like perhaps not to be uh, fully digital. And we also talk about Generation Z as being the generation that um, you know has spent their entire lives, their entire existence really around the war on terror. They don't know what it's like for the US not to be engaged in a war around the world. And, and so their um, sort of life has, has uh, had that as a backdrop. The other thing um, about millennials and Generation Z, and, and my book title is, uh, you know, or subtitle is uh, the political beliefs and policy preferences of America's most diverse generation. Um, millennials are indeed the the most diverse adult generation, meaning that the entire um, generation is adult, right? But Generation Z is going to surpass millennials as being the most diverse generation by the time they are all adults. Uh, and so you can see here, sort of the the um, diversity that I'm talking about uh, as far as pre-millennials and then millennials and, and post-millennials are, are what we call Generation Z now, what percentage of the population by the time 2035 comes around that they're gonna make up in, in terms of the diversity, right? Uh, Hispanic, Black, and Asian Americans um, relative to the white population. And, and these two generations are really leading um, the charge for the United States to become a majority minority country, which will probably happen somewhere between 2045 and 2050. 
one thing that we do know about young generations um, relative to other uh, generations in our history is that they tend to be more liberal. Um, and, and I know that we hear about uh, young people being liberal, right, and that they tend to get more conservative as they age. But what we're finding, particularly looking at millennials now that they're getting older and that the oldest millennials are, are 40 years old, is that this liberalness is persistent. So it's staying with millennials um, and we anticipate, we'll see what happens. We don't have the data on that yet and we won't until they get older, that it'll stay with generations as well because they have a lot of similarities to the issues that matter um, to both Generation Z and millennials. Um, and you can see here from this graph, uh, Pew has been tracking this uh, for generations millennial and older. And uh, by comparing older generations, you can see as they have aged that, you know, that whole adage about getting, becoming more conservative, right? I think everyone's probably heard this. If you are not a liberal at 25, you have no heart. If you are not a conservative at 35, you have no brain. Um, but what we are seeing uh, you know, in this younger generations, and particularly millennials, is that, the, is that this liberalness is persistent and that a larger percentage of that generation is staying liberal um, as they've gotten older. Uh, as I already mentioned, right, millennials and Generation Z are digital natives, and that really does define um, in large part who they are and the issues that they care about and how they receive information about those issues. Uh, and this is really important for how politicians target millennials, right, and how millennials and Generation Z may be mobilized uh, to become part of, of politics and to vote um, is living in this sort of uh, digital nativeness. Then one thing I also want to mention is uh, that, you know, for millennials, the Great Recession was a very defining uh, event in their lives. And, and it's something that has continued to affect them in terms of earning potential, um, in terms of paying college student loan debt, uh, and now the pandemic is something else that Generation Z is going to have to deal with as they start off in their um, careers uh, and in the job market, similar to how millennials had to deal with the Great Recession in 2008. So these two events really uh, in some ways are similar as far as how it's going to affect these two generations. And for millennials, they started their uh, you know, career or entering the job market during the Great Recession. Now at the height of their earning potential, they're having to deal with, with the pandemic. So it's really for them kind of bookends um, that, that are affecting them um, and still remains to be seen what significant effect it'll have on Generation Z. Uh, and another defining characteristic of young generations is their distrust in institutions. Um, so millennials and Generation Z compared to other generations are much more likely to distrust political parties, uh, government institutions like Congress and religious institutions. And this distrust and the fact that they have grown up around a time when, you know, Congress has been so gridlocked and there's so much political part to, uh, po polarization that it really does affect, you know, their enthusiasm for voting and, and participating in politics. Um, why it's so important as, as Justine talked about in terms of reaching out and personally reaching out uh, to, to young people and to get them to vote because they're already uh, predisposed to not trust um, uh, you know, government officials and elected politicians and feel that they don't really address the issues and don't really get anything done. And then two additional important factors that I think really define these generations are what I call cosmopolitan identity, which is that this idea that these two generations feel that they are so interconnected with the global environment compared to older generations. And they are much more likely to see themselves as citizens of the world compared to other generations. And this leads to sort of this collectivist worldview that there's the belief that society as a whole is paramount for individual interest and success. And so really, uh, that government should play a role, right, in securing um, the welfare and the shared welfare of, of, of humanity in general, but, but perhaps a country at large as well. Um, and they really do have a desire for uh, the world to be a better place. And, and so these ideas and attitudes are much more prevalent in, in young generations. And, and it's pretty easy to understand why, right? They're so interconnected in ways that older generations were not, that that at least is one reason that leads to, to sort of this identity um, and worldview that they have. And this is just quickly to show that there's a lot of similarities between Generation Z and millennials and a lot more distant in attitudes uh, about uh, particular issues 
um, compared to older generations. So really these two generations are, are very alike in, in their beliefs about diversity, race, the role of government, um, the importance of social issues, and as Justine mentioned, the importance of the environment, which is something that both of these generations care deeply about. Uh, but again, as I come back to this idea of how engaged millennials and Generation Z are um, uh, in, in politics, we do know that they participate and consistently vote at lower rates compared to the rest of the population. But when we talk about political engagement, I argue um, in, in my book and when I give talks like this is that we can't just look at voting to determine whether young people are politically engaged. Um, and, and the conclusion that we have drawn, uh, my co-author and I, in, in exploring surveys and doing focus groups with young people, is that you can, you can certainly answer yes if the only way that you are looking at political engagement is by looking at voting. And you can say that young people are not as engaged as older uh, generations. But voting is only one aspect of political engagement. And, and sort of this characterization is missing a nuance that is particular to these gen young generations, right? They're less engaged by conventional measures, uh, but they value representation and political outcomes. And they are really uh, defined and distinct from other generations in, in that they are much more of what we call engaged citizens. More direct individual actions, um, such as volunteering, protesting, and marching, relative to what we distinguish as duty-based uh, citizenship, which stresses the activity of maintaining political order, like voting, campaign contribution, and things like that. And so by the right measures, we can really see that young people are, are really engaged in politics and care um, about issues and about um, how those issues are addressed. It's just making this connection, right, between um, voting and how young people are engaged. And you can see from this graph that really there's not a lot of difference between millennials and non-millennials on a lot of these uh, points, except when it comes to voting, that's really where, where the distinction is. However, what we did see, right, um, in, the, in the 2018 midterm election is, and, and in 2020 really gives us hope for young people to, to become more engaged in voting and sort of seeing that gap close between being engaged citizens in different ways and actually coming out to vote, right? Um, we know that in the 2018 midterm elections, there was a significant increase among those uh, age 18 to 29 in coming out for a midterm election, which is already an, a, a type of election uh, where most people don't turn out, turn out to vote, particularly young people. And we saw a huge uptick um, in, in voting among young people during that 2018 midterm election. And then we also saw a, a significant increase, right, in 2020. And you can see from, from these numbers, particularly on the right, which are estimates uh, of, of actual increase, um, not just several days after the election, but, but we see compared to 2016, the increase that there was um, in turnout uh, among young people. Uh, and in particular key states, right, um, as Justine said, and as I have said, um, with the characteristics of young people, they tend to, to favor liberal and progressive policies and obviously support the candidate that, that sort of best embodies those policies. And we can see here that um, between Donald Trump and, and Joe Biden, that Joe Biden garnered a, a, a significant um, percentage of, uh, of the young vote, particularly in key states that were really determinative of the electoral outcome. And so young people did play a, a, an important role right, in coming out to vote in 2020 and um, how, how that contest was decided. Um, here, this, this sort of line graph just shows the fact that millennials and Generation Z uh, are, are increasingly making up a greater percentage of the electorate uh, as older generations sort of decline. So they have a lot of potential power, right, political power in what they can wield as, as um, right now and as they get older. Right. And so uh, I wanted to briefly just at the end here, um, share a couple of other things. Right. So first, uh, what about the Latino vote? Right. And what does that look like since I study Latino politics and it intersects with uh, my interest in youth voting? I wanted just to present to show you uh, that Latinos in particular are pretty liberal. They're also Latinos are very young. They're uh, a very young generation. Um, and, and make up, comprise uh, a huge percentage of millennials and of Generation Z. 
And so you can see that in particular, even um, young Latinos uh, favored um, Joe Biden, uh, you know, three to one, right, to, to Donald Trump. Um, and this graph shows you, uh, you know, what would it look like if only young people voted um, in the presidential election, right? If we took out older generations and only young people voted, uh, you can see sort of the, the coloration there, the purple being um, how much by Biden would have won by 30 plus points. And then it goes down from there, the, the lighter shades of, of blue, um, Biden still wins, but by a lower percentage. And then you see the states where, um, you know, Donald Trump would win if he, you know, if we were just looking at, at, at young people voting. And then this is the future power of young people, right? You can see here that by 2036, um, millennials and Generation Z will make up uh, more than six, almost 60%, right, of the electorate. Uh, so in just about, you know, 15 years, uh, these two generations are really, uh, really going to dominate. And I wanna finish my talk by uh, something that I think there's some interest in. Um, you know, some of you out there may be thinking, what happened to the Latino vote? In, um, in the 2020 election. Uh, there's been a lot of stories out there about the fact that, that Donald Trump and, and Republicans really made a gain among Latinos, particularly in Florida and particularly in Texas, right? And we've always heard about the Latino vote being a vote that the Democrats can count on um, in large part. And we can see from this number that Donald Trump certainly gained, right, a significant amount of Latino support compared to the support he had against Hillary Clinton in 2016. Um, and there's been a lot of criticism uh, put out there against Joe Biden and, and the Democrats about how much efforts they really made uh, to reach out uh, to the Latino vote, right? Um, Latinos in general are similar to young people in terms of, you know, you need to ask them and get, in, get them engaged in the process and ask them to come out and vote. Uh, and, and so that is uh, something that I think the Democrats are really looking, uh, analyzing about what they can do um, to make sure they mobilize the Latino vote. And, you know, Donald Trump didn't win Miami-Dade County, but he did much better, particularly among certain segments of Latinos, like Cuban Latinos, Venezuelan Latinos, who really came out um, much more strongly in support of him this election and really helped him carry Florida in the 2020 election. And similar changes occurred um, in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas that is predominantly uh, Latino, Star Hidalgo and Cameron County. Uh, where we can see a shift, um, right? Not that those, not the Democrat, uh, that Joe Biden lost those counties, but just a significant shift in, in uh, the support that Donald Trump got among Latinos. So something I'm happy to talk about more in the Q&A, but I kind of wanted to present um, those last uh, two slides to kind of show uh, some of the work that I've been looking at in terms of the Latino vote in the 2020 election. Um, and with that, I will wrap it up. Thank you so much, Kate, Justine, and Stella for three really wonderful and stimulating presentations. We're now going to move on to the question and answer portion of our panel. We're going to alternate between questions that some of our students were kind enough to provide us pre-taped and audience questions. So audience members, please type questions into the comments and don't forget to like and share us on social media. We're going to start with a question from Emily Barrio, class of... Hi, my name is Emily. I am a junior criminal justice major and I have minors in psychology and gender and women's studies. My question regards the past uh, 2020 presidential election. As we know, this was a huge election. We had an increase in voting. We elected our first woman, African-American, Asian-American vice president. So my question is, considering this rise in voting, do you think this will be a trend from now on? Do you think it will be a trend in future elections? Do you think we kind of knocked down that wall and got more people involved, more attention? Um, this was my first election I voted in, and I noticed a lot of my peers and people my age participated more than ever. Um, a second part of my question that goes along with that is, do you think that there are any specific contributors or what exact reasons you think that this is, um, has happened? Um, personally, I think social media is a huge reason, um, but I'm curious to see of what other reasons you think. Thank you so much. Who's answering that? 
Do you want us to just pipe in? Yes, why don't oh, you okay. all just, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yes, please just chime in as you'd like to. Um, I do, as I said, I think this did start to break down that barrier. Like once you start to vote, you realize how easy and not intimidating it is. Uh, you realize how much your life is affected by the people in those offices, you know, for better, well, not for better or worse, for worse, you know, Donald Trump has educated a whole generation of people, um, you know, how important it is to vote. And I, I truly think that that is going to make a difference. I am also technically in those years a millennial, although at the very, very high end. And, you know, I didn't vote in my first presidential election that I could because I like didn't know how to vote and I didn't know what to do and I didn't want to feel stupid when I get there. And so I think like, especially even our early voting and being able to vote by mail really helped um, young people vote more this year. And I think that it will continue. I hope that it will continue. So I think it'll continue too, but I want to make a connection between this question and something that Stella um, Stella said, you know, Donald Trump won Miami, uh, Joe Biden won Miami Dade, but Democrats across Florida and across the country, frankly, lost uh, race after race after race. While young people did go in and vote, and Hispanics, they were called to refer to themselves as Hispanics in Florida, not Latinos, um, went in and, and voted for president, they dropped off the ballot. They didn't go all the way down a la what Justine was talking about a while ago. And so we've got, we've got to continue to engage and continue to educate folks. The, the vote you cast for school board or for your state rep is as important in your life as, um, as the vote you cast for presidents. And what I saw working with down ballot candidates across the country is that the candidates who are closest to their constituency one. So Justine is a great example because she knocks the hell out of her district. She knocks on doors, knocks on doors, knocks on doors, right? Lots of other candidates just sat around and thought, you know, that they didn't need to engage with voters. They didn't need to talk to them and they didn't need to do that in a very warm way. Um, and, and those are the folks that lost. The people who were closest to their constituency were the people that won. And that takes voter engagement and engagement of the youth as well. Yeah, I would agree with with both what Kate and, and Justine said. Um, I think, you know, as as Kate said, uh, conveying to young people that even the down ballot elections are more important than president, right? Because it affects their daily lives. Um, things that they actually uh, engage with and do on a daily basis is, is really impacted much more um, by their school board member, um, by their elected uh, uh, state senator or state rep. Um, than, than what the president does. Uh, and so getting that message across is really important. Um, do I think that the voting that occurred uh, in larger numbers among young people is going to stick? I think that's the million dollar question. I, I do agree with Justine about the fact that once you get in the habit of voting, it's something that tends to stick. And hopefully that this election will make that happen. One thing that I, I do want to bring up with that is the fact that there was so much um, expansion of making voting easier for young people. And these are efforts that have gone on for years, right? And the pandemic um, accelerated this, right? Uh, early voting, voting by mail are, are ways that young people can get engaged in voting. Um, and and the, the research has shown that, that in places that have uh, eased voting restrictions, uh, get young people to vote at higher numbers. So the question is now, are we gonna have that um, in 2024, right? We've already seen states that have tried to take back um, the, uh, the ease of voting by instilling restrictions, reinstilling restrictions um, and introducing legislation that is going to go back to making voting harder. Um, and I think how that is uh, addressed and, and resolved in states uh, will say a lot about uh, um, whether young people uh, continue to vote at high rates. Thank you, Emily, for that great question and to our panelists for their responses. We're going to go now to a question from the audience. Do you think the pandemic and the pandemic recession will have a long-term effect on political behavior? I totally do. Um, I spend a lot of time teaching, 
women candidates, how to engage with voters how, and, and how to introduce themselves by looking them, looking the person um, that they're meeting in the eye and shaking their hand, which is totally not going to happen. I don't think again, um, massive places across the country. We stopped canvassing across the country in lots and lots of places. And we paid, uh, we paid a price in places where we um, the opposite, the opposing party did engage in door knocking. Um, you know, again, it goes back to the people closest to their constituency want. And so when uh, we seeded that sort of warm communication and moved only to social media engagement or television engagement, which is sort of one dimensional and not very effective, uh, it impacted those races. I think that uh, some of this is going to be with us for a long time. I think too that the pandemic has laid bare how much it has hurt women and people of color so much more uh, than other people, especially here in Rhode Island, that I think there are more people in those underrepresented communities at our state house and on our municipal governments that have realized that they are gonna need to step up and run um, with our help, um, Kate and I and others, uh, you know, to really make sure that they are protected and their communities are protected in our post-pandemic economy here in Rhode Island. Yeah, I think the pandemic has has really uh, laid bare the necessity for social safety nets. Um, it's something that this country has not been great at, right? It has um, really prioritized capitalism um, and um, individual freedoms. And uh, I think that has cost us as a country in terms of how we deal with the pandemic and where we are relative to other countries. And I think that young people in particular, people of color, those that the pandemic has disproportionately affected um, have felt the, the largest pain from that being the case. And those are issues that are gonna matter to those people moving forward. And so I think that is a way that the pandemic uh, will certainly change uh, the, the political outlook of a lot of uh, people moving forward. Thank you so much. We're now going to show a question from Molly Melnick, class of 2023, a political science and Spanish major. Hi, my name is Molly and I am a sophomore majoring in political science and Spanish at the University of Rhode Island. My question is in regards to people who claim that they aren't political people or don't want to get into politics. I've encountered many people like this, including my own friends, and it's hard to have a conversation with them regarding any sort of political issue, um, whether it's controversial or not. And I was wondering if you have any suggestions on how to convince and really stress the importance of politics and having these conversations in our daily lives. Thank you so much. Anyone? Does someone else want to go first? I feel like I dominated a little bit. So, you know, um, that's just our nature. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, I feel like politics has gotten so divisive that I think it is hard. People like to think of themselves as non-political because they think it means they are kind of non-controversial people or they don't want to argue about it. But, you know, what I always say is that if you are not into politics, you know, politicians are into making decisions for you and they're making decisions for you, whether you are into it or you know it or not. Um, and so I don't, I, I, part of my job that I like the best is talking to people who um, are not political or talking to people in a different political party. And like Kate said, I knock on every door in my district. So I have a lot of conversations with people and a lot of them start out with, oh, I'm not into politics. Um, but, you know, really talking to people about, um, what we call our kitchen table issues, what is going on in their lives. You know, the students at URI, um, you know, are gonna be greatly impacted by the political decisions that are happening right now. And when we talk about, you know, different people running for office at the pan after the pandemic, education is a huge one, a uh, huge reason people are gonna start running for office more, I think. So I always start those conversations by asking people questions about what is important to them, um, what would get them to vote, um, what kind of person they would like to vote for. And so, you know, those are tough conversations, but I think that you can, you can have them and they can end up really good 99% of the time. Yeah, I would agree just to <laughs> break up the order a little that, that all those things are important. I think it's tough sometimes um, getting people to move from, uh, you know, the side of the street where they're not engaged and, and don't see politics as working for them 
or that their vote doesn't count um, or that their voice doesn't count. Um, and, and that's a tough, um, tough proposition to, to move people uh, from that side of the street to the other side to show that that they really that their voice does really matter. And, and so I think the, the strategies of, um, you know, one on one communication, grassroots efforts, uh, again, um, asking people to participate and showing that how their participation makes a difference is, it, it is really important. Um, and I think peer pressure too, right? So if there are young people in a group and, and some of those friends um, are, are politically active and politically engaged, that, that makes a difference as well. Some of the literature has shown that, that, that peer, peer pressure in a good way um, gets people um, engaged in the process. Thank you. Our next question comes from the audience. For the 2020 national election, Latinos in Arizona did lots of grassroots organizing to turn the state blue. However, South Texas, particularly border towns, showed huge gains for Trump, keeping Texas red. Were you surprised by Mexican American support for Trump in South Texas, or did you see this trend coming? Um, I guess I'll, I'll take that just from <laughs> the research that I do. So I think one thing to keep in mind when we talk about Latinos is that that is a huge umbrella where we put a very diverse group of people under. Um, Latinos are very different across uh, nationality uh, in the issues that they care about. And even within nationalities, they, they are they are very different. And, and so I am often, you know, very squeamish when I hear the media talk about Latinos as this monolithic group of people that just have, that are gonna vote a certain way in every certain area. And so it really makes a difference for political parties, um, grassroots organizations to understand the community that they are um, trying to engage and trying um, to mobilize. Uh, and I think one criticism perhaps of, of the Democratic Party is often that they take the, the Latino vote for granted, that they do uh, treat them as, as, as more monolithically than they are. Um, and, and that they believe, you know, that they're going to come out to vote regardless of, of the efforts that they make. And, and so, you know, obviously campaigns have to um, make decisions about trade-offs and where they, they put their money um, and their efforts, uh, but certainly not reaching out to particular uh, Latino communities in certain areas like the Rio Grande Valley. I think immigration has become a huge issue there. And there's an assumption that um, Mexican Americans and others in that area are going to be very pro-immigration, where that may not necessarily be the case because they view immigration differently, perhaps as a you know as a threat to to their livelihood and as competition. And, and so, I think issues for Latinos need to be disaggregated by nationality and by location and region in order to be able to reach those people and um, address the issues that they care about. Thank you, Stella. That's a great segue to our next two questions. We have two related video questions about Latino voting. One is from Paige Vogel, a psychology major from the class of 2022. And the other is from Melanie Garcia, a nursing and communication studies major from the class of 2024. My name is Paige. I'm a psychology major here at the University of Rhode Island. Um, I have an interest in both women's studies and women's rights. So my question today is kind of about the present day general discord of Latino voting. So I know that the 2020 election had a decent diverse turnout, um, but it could have been better. So at the fundamental level, why do you think that Latinas are still largely just disengaged in the political process? Do you think it's lack of representation? Do you think they feel as if their um, vote doesn't hold any power? Hi, my name is Melanie. As a Latina woman, I have always felt that voting is something that is not stressed enough throughout our community. During this year's election, I will bring such topic to my family and many members will show no interest on elections or civic engagement whatsoever. I remember my uncle's answer as, I don't care who the president is as long as I get paid for my job. Having said that, how do you think we could encourage more Latinos into participating more on voting? Does anybody want to take that one first? Sure. I, I mean, I think that Latinas, like everyone else, um, you know, are no different than anybody else. We're not talking to people right if they're not going to vote. 
Um, if, if, if the folks that are operatives and candidates and run campaigns do their job, they're not just reaching out to constituencies a week or six weeks or eight weeks before an election. They're talking to those folks year round and they're engaging them and sitting in their homes and sitting in their churches and listening and understanding their struggles and trying to organize, you know, to make the world better. Um, as opposed to, hi, I'm on the ballot, go vote next Tuesday. That is not voter engagement. And I think that we have to get a more, at a granular level, understanding our constituencies and talking to them um, in ways that are routine and regular, that they can hear and understand in their language. And then the, the second thing is, um, more Latinas will vote if more Latinas are on the ballot. When women run, uh, women vote. And when Latinas run, more Latinas vo vote. So maybe both you young ladies need to get yourselves on the ballot. <laughs> Stella, would you like to respond? Sure. No, I think uh, Kate made some really, really good points. Um, I think there's a number of reasons that research has shown uh, why why Latinos uh, historically don't vote at higher numbers. There's always this idea that they're the sort of the um, uh, the giant in waiting because based on their numbers, they can certainly have uh, significant political power if they all turned out to vote, right? But again, that is that is treating a group very monolithically when they are not. Um, in terms of their diversity. And I think, um, you know, mobilization is key for Latinos. Uh, Latinos tend to come out to vote when they are asked to vote and when they are engaged in the political process. And um, and like Kate said, not, you know, just two weeks before an election, but, but, but really establishing relationships with those communities and discussing the issues that those communities care about. Another historic, historic reason why Latinos have been voted at larger numbers is that for a long time, Many Latinos were not citizens, right? They were uh, they were immigrants um, who were less likely than other immigrant groups um, to sort of go through the naturalization process and and then um, you know register to vote. That reason I think is becoming less and less important because Latinos uh, mo a majority of Latinos now are native born, right? And so they are already citizens, um, and and less of them are. Um, you know, immigrants and having to go through that process. There's still quite a number of those, and certainly that sort of outreach should continue. But the strategy should change in terms of um, engaging young Latinos and mobilizing. Uh, you know, uh, using grassroots efforts to mobilize those young Latinos at a at an early age. Great, thank you so much. We now have a question from the chat coming. This is a question from Sierra Gray, who asks, due to the rise of social media and the internet in the past few decades, do you believe voting will ever be introduced virtually via the internet? Are you aware of any local elections that do this? I actually serve on a board that has members all over the world. And we have just started using a, a, an online voting process. Um, and it is intriguing and holds some opportunity for the future, I think. But in, mo in many states, you know, we have folks who can't wrap their heads around early voting or voting by mail. Um, you know, we've seen in this last election an increase, a substantial increase in both those methods of voting. Um, some states like Oregon have had only mail voting for years. Um, I think it's it, it will happen, but probably not in my lifetime. I think if there's anything that has had a terrible negative effect on politics, and especially being a woman in politics in the last several years, it has been social media. Um, I could talk for hours um, about that issue. So I'm not looking to put anything more related to politics and elections online. Um, you know, but I do have to concur with Kate, you know, I even serve with a lot of people who are Democrats who were worried about, you know, so many people voting by mail and mailing everyone an application for a mail ballot like Secretary Corbea did and for our local uh, issues uh, on March 2nd. Kate, thank you for mentioning that. Um, so, you know, I don't know how well received that would be with, 
with a large population of people. But you know, that's one issue where young people can push really hard, and that would be an interesting thing to see them having about. Yeah, I'll just add really quickly that this last election probably did a lot to, in the short run, kill any momentum that there might have been toward, um, you know, internet voting, for example, because of the, uh, you know, false narrative of the election being rigged, right? So imagine we've already had that narrative in a situation where we've had, um, uh, you know, mail-in voting and early voting. I, I can't imagine what it would take to, uh, you know, convince a large swath of the population that any voting that's done online would be done safely, at least in the near future. Um, and I concur that that hopefully young people can can you know bring that about, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. Thank you, Sear, for that really thought-provoking question. We now have a question from Claire Estesui, and forgive me if I mispronounced your last name, Claire. As a millennial, I can definitely say that I feel my trust in voting is very little, but we do feel like our voices need to be heard. So like Stella mentioned, we are more likely to protest. I think that this has also pushed for more diversity and equality in politics. Since voting is important, how do you think trust can be established to our generation? Well, Stella, your vote does matter and not a little, it matters a lot. For people who even follow Rhode Island politics, you know, some of our races have been decided by, Kate, you can probably know better than I, but some of these races with the colleagues I serve with have been decided by literally a handful of votes. So it can feel like when you go to cast your ballot, it's not meaningful, but truly, especially in these local races, every vote counts. And so, you know, it can be hard to imagine that, but from where I'm sitting, I ask for every vote and every one of them is important to me and to being elected and to being a voice up there from my constituents. That's a good answer. Mine was not that close this time around, luckily, but you never know. 2022 is coming up. <laughs> Thank you. Our next question, also from the chat, comes from Gretchen Macht. How can we get more women in the Senate? How can women overcome the types of stigmas that have prevented them in the past? Um, we will get more women in the Senate when more women run. And I look forward to the day when I do a training for a group of women and I don't have to talk about their hair or their clothes um, or the way they talk. Uh, or their, you know, perceived itchiness. Um, I'm looking forward to that. Right now, women are held to a different standard, and you, you know, you see it. You saw it. You see it today. Mira Tandon um, is being held to a, a grossly different standard about her former tweets than the guy that just left office a, a month or so ago. Women are definitely held to a different standard, but that will only change when there are 51 plus women on the floor of the U.S. Senate. I mean, um, when Carol Mosley Braun was first elected to the U.S. Senate, when, um, uh, what's her name? The first woman elected to the Senate in her own right, Barbara Mikulski. You know, she, there were no women's bathrooms on the floor of the Senate. Now those things have been changed and there has been progress, but we will only get more women in if more women run. If you look at um, the floor of the U.S. House and every Democratic pro-choice woman on that floor has been through a training program that I've either run myself or helped build. So starting at the grassroots and getting you know women sort of involved and engaged uh, will help as well. But that's not to say that you that you need to you know, run for mayor and then city councilor and then county commissioner and then governor and in order to get to the Senate, you don't have to do all those things. If you wanna run for the US Senate, you should start to live your life today like you were gonna do that and build the network that helps you get there. I would add too that it is so true that women are held to a higher standard than men. And one of the best ways we can reduce that standard is not to hold other women running for office or in our communities to that higher standard. 
you know, that is a huge problem. I do think women need to stick together a little more. You know, we give, frankly, um, white men and white male politicians a pass for a lot of things that we don't give women and our fellow female colleagues a pass for. And I think we really need to start within our own community of reducing that stigma and sticking together. And it will make us more successful on all the issues that we're fighting for together in state houses and in Congress. That's a great point. Well, thank you so much to Kate, Stella, and Justine for a fantastic presentation and to our students and other members of our audience for asking such great questions. I hope you'll all join us next Thursday, March 4th at seven o'clock when Professor Wendy Rouse of San Jose State University speaks about the queer history of the suffrage movement. Please visit uri.edu forward slash suffrage for more information on this and future events, as well as to watch past lectures from the fall. Thank you again and good night.